Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host. Hello, my name is Nick Johnson, and I run a blog, MillennialFreemason.com. I've been a Mason for almost 13 years. It's kind of an amazing journey that I've had. I've met many brothers online. I've learned so much about Freemasonry, and I'm still learning more. Worshipful Brother Robert asked me to perhaps appear as a guest on his podcast, the guest host, to talk about different things that I've been thinking about over the years. And it's been uh, it's been interesting walking back through my bo- my my old blog, looking at the different things I've written. And I started from the very beginning, and I've witnessed a change in how I view the fraternity and how I how I think of myself in this craft and the world out there as well. It's 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 an amazing journey to watch as you change and grow and go from being a young adult to a, well, not so young adult, to where I'm at now. And Freemasonry has been there along the way. So hopefully the uh, two pieces that I've chosen will resonate with hopefully most of you, and I'm assuming those that are of my age will definitely get something out of it. So uh, without further ado, the first paper. First paper I'll be reading is When the Honeymoon is Over by Nick Johnson. As I get farther and farther away from my date of initiation, I'm starting to see the fraternity differently. I can get a little sad and a little nostalgic over my past steps in Freemasonry, especially those initial steps. All of us at some point get past the Masonic Honeymoon. I think most of you will get where I'm coming from. You start off not knowing anything about masonry. The excitement of the craft is overwhelming. Since masonry requires the petitioner to come forward, he is the initial spark. I remember my first step came when I chatted with my grandpa about Freemasonry. He was never a garrulous man, so for me to learn this fact was eye-opening. There are still things I'm learning about my grandfather. Then the whirlwind romance with Freemasonry begins. I got my petition and started the process. I visited the lodge my grandpa's friend recommended. I loved it. The early 20th century layout of the building was incredible. Then I visited a number of the brothers and found a home. I fit right in. The degree work started and I was totally impressed. I met my mentor Don and found someone I could respect as well as learn from. I kicked butt in my memory work and discovered that I was a ritualist. Masonry was this thing that filled a gap in my mind and heart that I never knew existed. I was in heaven. I'd learned another piece of ritual and get super excited. This would lead me to read books. A little pike, a little mackey, a lot of pound. My wife can attest to my library growing to several volumes of Masonic material. I just couldn't stop. I went through the chairs. I bounced up the chairs, learning and loving every minute. Even my time as master was fun. Then I entered the downward phase from the high as master. My lodge has the bylaws set to have the outgoing master serve as the lodge education officer and the outgoing lodge education officer to serve as marshal to ensure some level of continuity in the line. And then my year as marshal was done. It was just done. My career in my lodge was now past master. That was it. Cue whatever the opposite of swelling music is. I sat in my chair at home and thought about everything that had happened in my near decade in masonry. The honeymoon was over. Although I was active in my chapter at that time, it still felt like the air had been let out of the balloon. I felt like a left-handed monkey wrench. Was I even necessary to my lodge? I know that's a little self-serving, but honestly, I have to think about that sometimes. I think we all get wrapped up in these things that affect our identity and take a lot of our time. I couldn't stop thinking about masonry, even keeping me up at night. I spent hours in my car learning ritual, but sometimes I sit back and think, were those hours wasted? Did I really spend my time well? I think those questions are important to ask, especially to keep your sanity. Once you get past that honeymoon phase, you have to focus on maintaining the relationship similar to a long-time friendship or a marriage. 
Not everything is love and affirmation. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes there's stress. Sometimes you get excited again for something you're doing together. But a lot of it is just maintenance. That's why I think we see a lot of guys fade out in five or ten years. It's not just that we need mentoring. It's not just focusing down at the newish mason past his honeymoon with the craft from the organization. It's also counseling the newish mason that his attraction to the craft will wax and wane. Sometimes masonry is just going through the motions. Sometimes it's exciting as hell as you discover something new. But it's not a climb up. It's just a rolling wave through your life. And that's actually masonry's greatest power. We can walk away from it for a time. We can put it on hold. We can come back to it. We can keep it on a low boil. But no matter what, masonry is always there. So my advice as a guy who has passed that honeymoon phase, just roll with it. If you need to take a breather, take a breather. If you want to chat with your brothers, go ahead and find out what they're doing just to keep going. Masonry is like a friendship or a marriage. You have to work at it to keep it strong and healthy. The James Bond of his time, Deon de Beaumont, was a French knight, a spy in the elite secret espionage force of King Louis XV and a swashbuckling swordsman. A member of the Lage de Mortalité 376 in London, he was also a member of the Royal Court, a captain of dragoons wounded in the Seven Years' War, and a recipient of the coveted Order of St. Louis for service to France and King Louis XVI, assuming the throne upon the death of his grandfather, ordered de Beaumont to wear a dress for the rest of his life. You heard that right. The bizarre story of Le Chevalier Deon de Beaumont puzzled his contemporaries and has caused historian sense to speculate about the motives behind his quirky personality. It all started when Louis XV decided to stick his nose in Russian affairs. He needed a spy. Fair featured, one reason de Beaumont enjoyed stunning success as a spy was his ability to disguise himself as a woman and move about unnoticed. He was so convincing in this role that he conspired with Russia's Empress Elizabeth to pass himself off as her maid of honor. After de Beaumont's mission in Russia, King Louis XV developed secret plans to invade England. He shared those plans with de Beaumont and sent him there to spy on the English and gather information that would facilitate the impending conflict. De Beaumont was so successful, Louis XV appointed him Minister Plenipotentiary the most powerful French citizen in England. De Beaumont enjoyed his elevated status in England until the king abandoned his plan to invade England and appointed the Count of Guerchet as that country's French ambassador. In the same action, the king demoted de Beaumont, betraying his years of loyalty. De Beaumont, in return, used secret French documents to discredit Guerchet and have him convicted of corruption. De Beaumont shrewdly held back the documents which exposed the plans King Louis XV had devised to invade England. Not only did this in all likelihood save his life, but it also gave him an enormous amount of leverage in his future negotiations with the French government, and negotiate he did, obtaining a generous pension and keeping his job as a spy, although the king refused to let him return to France. Continuing to live in England, de Beaumont began to dress openly as a woman, and rumors circulated that he actually was a female. He refused to cooperate with requests to prove his sex. Homesick, de Beaumont negotiated his return to France by agreeing to relinquish the damning documents detailing France's previous intention to invade England. He also demanded the French government officially recognize him as a woman. 
King Louis XVI agreed, but in return ordered him to dress as a female for the remainder of his life. De Beaumont consented, and astonishingly, King Louis paid for his wardrobe. His Masonic records are lost, but from that point it is certain De Beaumont never entered a Masonic lodge again. Speculation raged over his true gender. De Beaumont continued to insist he was a female, but never offered proof. He lived another 33 years after returning to France, all the while claiming to be a woman. He lost his pension and died penniless in London in 1810. Finally, an autopsy ended speculation about his gender when it determined conclusively that Le Chevalier Déon de Beaumont was, anatomically at least, a male. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. My second paper is Going to My Grandpa's Home Lodge by me, Nick Johnson. The great thing about being in Minnesota is that sometimes, if a lodge needs a ritualist for some part, a lot of us will drop everything to help. I've been fortunate to help at a number of lodges, and when I was an elected officer of my Blue Lodge, to have brothers come in to help us out. When I received a phone call from one of my mentors about potentially helping out with some degree work, I just got ready to suit up and head out the door. Then he mentioned the lodge. Fidelity Lodge, number 39, in Austin, Minnesota. Fidelity? Really? Fidelity Lodge is my grandfather's mother lodge. Grandpa Dick passed away a few years back, and even now it's tough to think about his passing. Grandpa Dick was the man who got me started on my Masonic journey. He's a man I continue to respect more so each day. When I got the call to help, I was beside myself. How could I possibly say no? I've always had a major regret. It still eats at me every time I think of it. My grandpa was one of those Masons that joined at a very young age, around the same time that I did. And after a long life, he finally arrived at his 60th year as a Mason. The ceremony for his 60-year pin presentation was scheduled on the same night as a lodge meeting when I was still warden for my lodge. Sadly, what I now describe as the rather useless, kinda dumb pre-meeting program was set for that same evening. Me being a dumb young officer. I believe that I couldn't miss the rather useless, kind of dumb pre-meeting program, so I skipped his 60-year award. He passed a couple years later, so I missed all further anniversary celebrations. All potential trips to his lodge to sit in lodge with the man that made me a mason were never, ever going to happen. I am still devastated. So when I received the phone call to help, I felt that maybe, just maybe, redemption was possible. Austin is a little bit of a drive from my house, but I was fortunate to have my mentor drive. We talked and shared stories and just had a real good time. I visited Austin my whole life, but had never seen the lodge, not even the exterior of the building. This was all new to me. I can honestly say I was nervous, like teeth chattering nervous. We got to the door and I started to think about what went through my grandpa's head when he opened this exact same door the first time he visited the lodge before he even became a mason. I looked up the long flight of stairs, the really, really long flight of stairs, and I paused. This is it, I thought. This is my grandpa's Masonic home. I got to the top of the stairs, and everyone saw us and started shaking our hands. It was as if I had known these men my whole life. One of the first men I met was Otto. Otto is a very important mason to my Masonic story. When I was considering petitioning, my grandpa asked Otto, if he knew a local lodge where I could join. He got in contact with my mentor and I was off to the races. I had never met Otto and had only spoken to him once over the phone. Otto was a great man and I had a lot of fun talking to him about my grandpa and the lodge. I also met Bill, who is, and sadly passed, a great mason and was also very kind to show me around the lodge. I was fortunate to have eaten with him and chatted about all things Masonic. It was also great to see Dean again. Dean and I have seen and chatted with each other at Southeast Area events often, for almost a decade now. For the longest time, he was the only Austin Mason 
other than my grandpa, that I knew, and he was always happy to tell me about him. Finally, the meal was over and I needed to focus. Ritual is very important to me, and whenever I am the senior deacon on this particular degree, I have to get my game face on. You know, Masons and Preston Webb states, you know what I'm talking about, right? Considering where I was, though, it was even more important to me. We had three candidates that night, and I wanted to do a great, you know what, scratch that, stellar job for them. As I began my ritual work, I started to look at the benches, at the officer's chair, at the altar, and the large lodge room. In my mind, I saw my grandpa. He was there. He was there listening to me deliver the ritual. He was there smiling with an encouraging glance. He was there as the candidate experiencing the ritual for the first time. He was there as a longtime member, listening again to the important lessons conveyed. He was there with me. As we finished up the ritual work for the night, I finally sat down in the chair. I was emotionally drained but happy. I looked around. They were smiling. It was as if everyone in the room was saying, You made your grandpa proud. It was tough not to tear up at that moment. During the comments section, when everyone in the lodge was asked if they had something to say, I paused to let everyone speak. Finally, I stood up. I told everyone who I was and what the lodge meant to me. A lot of you knew my grandfather. My grandfather was a man of few words. So with that in mind, I just want to say thank you. I just remember the thank yous. We closed the lodge, and I went out to chat with everyone. A number of the brothers came up to me and told me little stories about my grandpa. One brother told me that he worked with him on the railroad, starting the fire in the engine, and he even said to me that I would never remember his name, <laughs> which turned out to be true. Another told me about bowling with him. It was great. You know what? It was great. I was starting to fill in the blanks of his life, a life I had never known. Bill pulled out a book of members, and there was my grandpa's page, right there, open on the counter. I stared at the page a long time. This was his record. This was the record of my grandfather. He had a memorial laid up in this very lodge's records for eternity. As I was leaving, the brothers were kind enough to hand me a mug and a pen from their sesquicentennial, and then later they even sent me a thank you card. As we drove away, the night sky filled with low clouds. I looked out the window at a view that I had seen countless times, but one I best remembered as a child. The cornstalk swayed as a late August rain was slowly rolling in, and my mind wandered back to that cold and crisp Thanksgiving in 2005. My family and I entering my grandparents' door, greetings exchanged and coats doffed and hung. I remember seeing the letter on the counter, a letter from a knightly order, and the long conversation I had with a man I admired then and continue to admire now. Now that I have my own kids and my dad is a grandpa, I often think about the time when my own kids are grown. What will life be like for them? But I try not to tarry too long in that question. I start to play with them and wish they'd stop growing. I wish those little moments could slow down. That I could have just one more hour at the playground. Just one more day before he has to start preschool. Just one more year before he's getting on the school bus. And that's the funny thing. When you want time to stop, it speeds up. As one brother told me, raising children is a lot like this. The days are long and the years are short. The best we can do is try our best to remember to store away those memories in our heart. I'm going to say something that we never said while you were alive. But Grandpa, I love you. I miss you. Your great-grandchildren are doing great and I look forward to seeing you again. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Be sure to join us for our next edition.